So just for interest, this was one of the possible cover designs for the book, The Gumball Machine. Uh, but for some reason, they didn't go with it. But I think it's really cute. So I'm a little disappointed that this wasn't on the cover. But let's talk about how you build a planet. So I'm going to start with what I hope is a fairly familiar planetary system to you all. This one. So, Sun, our nearest star. And then four small rocky worlds, Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars. And then beyond Mars, we have a band of rocky, rubbly leftovers from the planet formation process. And we call this first rubbly graveyard the asteroid belt. And in the asteroid belt, it includes the dwarf planet Ceres. Now beyond this, we have the giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And then beyond Neptune, we have a second band of rubbly rocky leftovers known as the Kuiper belt. And the most famous member of the Kuiper belt is of course the dwarf planet Pluto, but no one really talks about that anymore. And you are, I hope you realize, here. So if we were to say, well, okay, we've got these eight planets. What do we know about planet formation? The first thing we would note is they're divided into two groups. We have the rocky planets. So these are planets like Earth or Mars, and they have a solid surface, and they have a relatively thin atmosphere surrounding that solid surface. And then beyond the asteroid belt, we have gas giants. And they're called gas giants because most of their volume is taken up by their huge atmospheres. And these colossal atmospheres surround, we believe, a solid core. But if you were to be standing anywhere near that core, the pressure of all that air above you would just flatten you. It is so high pressure that even the hydrogen gas, which is the lightest gas we know, is crushed into a form that causes it to behave like a metal. And nowhere on Earth have we convincingly reproduced pressures like what we believe are close to the core of Jupiter. So, two types of planets, and based on their orbits, we're going to say there are three rules that we can take away based on planet formation in the solar system. The first rule is that orbits are circles as opposed to ellipses. So while they're not absolutely perfect circles, they are more or less circular. Our distance from the sun doesn't change a lot during the year, and that's true for most of the other planets. Second rule is the orbits are in the same plane. So that means that they are all orbiting in the same disc shaped bit of space as opposed to random angles everywhere. The third rule is that our gas giants are further from the star than the rocky planets. So we have a system like this and not like that. So this seems to be what our solar system tells us are the rules for planet formation. And based on these, we built up a mechanism for how planets form. So, Planets form in these disks of gas and dust that we call protoplanetary disks, and they surround young stars. They surround nearly all young stars. So almost all stars have the ability to have planets around them. And this explains our first rule. So planets are born in the same plane because they all form in this pizza-shaped disk of dust and gas. So that causes them all to stay in this thin pizza slab as they orbit the star, as opposed to having orbits that go up and down and left and right. Now this is an artist image on the backdrop here, but we have actually seen these in action. So this is what the real one looks like, taken with the telescope ALMA. So we're pretty convinced this much is true. Now, within this disk of dust and gas, you start off with micrometer-sized grains of dust, really, really tiny. And these collide and they stick and they go up to sort of centimetre, millimetre, metre sizes and steadily bigger and bigger. And eventually they become so big 
that gravity pulls the whole thing into a ball and it starts to look like a planet. Now this actually explains our second rule because this process of sticking stuff works best if you're on a circular orbit. If you're on a strongly elliptical bent orbit, what you find is that you collide at much higher speeds. And if you collide too fast, you tend to bounce like a terrible car wreck, as opposed to stick. So, final subtlety. If you are forming close to the star, you're going to be quite hot. Whereas if you are forming further away, it's going to be much colder. And this has an important side effect. At some point as we move away from the star, ice starts to form. And we call this point the ice line, the snow line, or the frost line. And if you're inside this line, ice isn't a solid, it's just a gas steam. But if you're outside this line, then it becomes a solid. So that means that when you're looking at planet building material, there's only silicates and dry grains inside the ice line. But outside the ice line, those silicate rocky grains are joined by a lot of ice. So you get a lot more building material when you pass the ice line into these colder areas. So that means we expect giant planets out here because there's just more stuff to build with when it's cold and you've got ices. Whereas when you're inside and you haven't got any ices, you've just got less Lego bricks effectively and therefore you build smaller planets. So that explains our last rule. This is why we expect close-in planets to be small and planets more distantly to be further out. And this was all we knew based on our solar system, but it seemed very solid. We had evidence, we had a theory, everything seemed to work. And then everything changed. And I'm gonna spend the rest of this talk breaking all three of those rules with exoplanet discoveries. So, just remind ourselves, what is an exoplanet? Our sun is only one of 100 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. And when we talk about extrasolar planets, extra here means outside, and solar means sun. So extrasolar, or exoplanet, is a planet that is outside the solar system. So any planet that is not orbiting our sun is an exoplanet. And in 1995, an exoplanet was discovered. It wasn't actually the first planet to be discovered, but it was the first one to be orbiting a star that was similar to our sun. And it was the same size as Jupiter. That seems quite reasonable. A gas giant, therefore, okay. But its orbit, so its whole year, took just four days. For comparison, Mercury is our closest planet to the sun. It has the shortest year in our solar system, and it takes 88 days. Of course, on the Earth, we take 365 for one year, but this planet took just four days to make its orbit. This gave it, it made it incredibly close to the star, and it gave it a temperature of a whopping 1260 Celsius, 1260 centigrade. Incredibly hot. And as a result, this new class of planets was called the hot Jupiters. So here we have a gas giant, but one very, very close to the star. And if we just remember from our solar system, the gas giants should be out here, and the rocky planets should be here, and this was because of rule three, where we said, well, gas giants form far from the star because there's lots more building material further out. There isn't supposed to be enough building material to build a planet close to the star. It's too hot, there's no ice. So how on earth do we get a system like this, where we have a huge planet, one that required tons of building material, but it's so close to the star, there should be barely any building material. So here is our first exercise. How do you think hot Jupiters form? So I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes to discuss that. And no idea is too crazy. When we found these planets, we were completely perplexed as the scientist community. 
So have a think, how would you get a Jupiter planet close to its star? And in a few minutes, I'm going to ask for suggestions. Okay, let's take some suggestions. What ideas have people got? What's your idea? It first started out like the, like the sun. It was like a Mercury-like planet. And then, well, and then, but since there weren't enough material around it, uh, the sun eventually radiated enough gas because it was so close. I see. So your idea is it was small, but then it stole material from the sun and produced a huge atmosphere. Yeah. Great idea. What else have people got? Come on, that was a great idea. I'm sure you guys have other ideas. No idea is too crazy. What are you guys thinking? So you think there might have been actually more building material close to the star because it was this different form of ice that doesn't melt as easily. Another excellent idea. Anyone else? Anything from the parents? <laughs> Charlie? Uh, if another uh, planet or another big, something big, uh, pulled it off its, uh, the gravitational pull pulled it off its normal orbit and it got Okay, so this one, it would have started further away, but something knocked it inwards. All right, there are three ideas. So, we have a theory, but I'm just going to go through the ideas here, first of all. Your idea is excellent. The reason we think it might not work is that the planet, because it's smaller, it has quite weak gravity. So that makes it hard for it to steal material from the sun because it's just got, the sun's got so much gravity, it holds on to its stuff pretty tightly. So although that effect can happen, it normally happens when you have two stars or something of similar mass where they can have this tug of war material. Your idea of ice, interestingly, is possible, but it can't be small grains. So what you can find is if the ice is already in a planet, and therefore it's been compressed to really high pressures, then it can survive close to the star. But it's harder for any form of ice to survive at lower pressures, for instance, around rocky uh, dust and things like that. So it would need to already be in the planet to live. The idea of scattering, we're gonna come back to later. The main problem with that in this case is where is the body that did the scattering? Sometimes there is evidence, but in this particular case, there is not. All right, so I'm going to talk about what we believe is the main theory for this hot Jupiter. So let's go back to our planet building. Initially, we start off, like I say, with our dust, and this starts sticking, and we get bigger and bigger rocks. And eventually we end up at something the size of Mars. Now Mars is actually a really small planet. It's only got a tenth of the mass of the Earth. But at Mars, something important starts happening. And that is, when you reach Mars size, the planet's gravity becomes strong enough to pull on the surrounding gas and dust so remember, it's still building itself up inside this gas and dust protoplanet disk. But its gravity at this point starts to get big enough that it pulls on this dust. And this dust starts pulling back. And the result of this is a little bit like running around a circular running track. So here are you, and you have two friends, a bunny and a detective. And for some very strange reason, someone thought it would be hilarious to tie you together. Now, a little later on, you have run to here, but as I'm sure everyone can appreciate from running around a school running track, if you're on the inside lane, you have a very unfair advantage because you have a shorter distance to go to loop around that running track. So that means your bunny friend has overtaken you and he is here. Meanwhile, your detective friend is on the longer path still further out and so she's a bit far behind. 
And the result is that you end up being pulled forward by the bunny and pulled back by the detective. So exactly the same thing happens with the gas. The gas inside is trying to drag the planet forward with this mutual gravitational tie. Whereas the gas further out and the dust further out is pulling back like a drag force. So you have this sort of tug of war situation between the gas and dust inside and the gas and dust outside. And now typically the inside forces win and the planet ends up pulled towards the star. So we call this planetary migration. So what we can have therefore is our Jupiter, born exactly where it should be, where there's lots of ice and there's lots and lots of dust for it to build up and become huge. But while it's building up, this gas drag starts happening and it migrates inwards towards the star. And the result is a Jupiter-sized planet, but one very close to the star. So it forms far out, where we've got plenty of building material, and then it moves inwards. And the result, is a hot Jupiter. So now, interestingly, going back to your point, if this Jupiter formed here, it would have had a lot of ice inside it. And this ice it keeps because it's crushed it to such high pressures, it can survive the heat of the star. But if it wasn't in the planet and it was in a smaller pile of rocks, the ice would just evaporate. But if it's safely in a planet, you can have hot ice. Okay, so that's our first mystery somewhat solved. Let's go to our second one. This was actually the all-time first discovery of a planet outside our solar system. And the story begins not with a brand new telescope, but actually with a broken one. So in 1990, the Arecibo radio telescope in Puerto Rico was in need of some repairs. So I confess this is genuinely Arecibo, but this movie is actually from James Bond Goldmine. <laughs> so Arecibo did not fortunately have this genuinely happen to it. Instead, the telescope needed repairs due to some fairly minor structural cracks. But there were some concerns because a similar telescope in the US also had structural cracks. Everyone would have gone, oh, it's minor, it'll be fine. And the whole telescope had collapsed. So as a result, Arecibo was like, okay, we're going to fix this. And during repairs, the telescope had to be completely stationary. It couldn't be moved. Now, this is a problem for observing because normally during the night, your object that you want to observe rises and comes up and then sets again. So the telescope needs to move to follow that star or planet or whatever around the sky. But during repairs, Arecibo had to be completely stationary, so it couldn't do this tracking during the night. And that made it unsuitable for almost all projects. However, at the time was a researcher called Alex Wolschen, who is Polish, but he was based at Arecibo, and he proposed using a telescope for a month-long project. Now, this project was designed to take up half the telescope's total time. So normally, the project would have been refused. I mean, this is the largest telescope in the world, and Alex was like, yo, I want like half that time for a month. And people would be like, no. But since no one else could really use it, and he was based at the telescope, they said, sure, okay. And Alex was looking for a type of dead star, which we call a pulsar. So, what is a pulsar? When you have a star that's a lot more massive than the sun, more than eight times, it eventually runs out of fuel. So it's been burning hydrogen and helium and carbon, but eventually there's no more fuel to burn. And at that point, these really heavy stars explode in something called a supernova. And the end result is a very, very tiny core that collapses rapidly. And it becomes so incredibly dense that its atoms start to break apart. And when this happens, you're left with a type of subatomic particle called a neutron. Now, neutrons are often found in the center of atoms, 
but with positively charged uh, protons and also some negative electrons. These all go, and you get almost exclusively neutrons. And so we call this a neutron star. And it is immensely tiny and dense. The size of a neutron star is only about the size of a city. And yet it has a mass of between 1.4 and twice that of the sun. So it is insanely dense. I think somewhere the statistic was, if you could squeeze the whole of the human race into a sugar cube, that is how dense a neutron star is. Now, as it compresses, these stars have strong magnetic fields and they get stronger and stronger and stronger. And anything that is remotely charged gets ripped off the star and funneled as strong, powerful jets that pour out of the star. Now, if these jets happen to be orientated so they sweep past the Earth, like so, we see a periodic flash, like a lighthouse or a light pulse, and therefore we call this a pulsar. Now, the pulse is extremely regular. In fact, when it was first discovered by Jocelyn Bell Brunel, in uh, the UK while she was doing her PhD at Cambridge. The pulse was so incredibly accurate, it rivaled atomic clocks. And she thought, could this actually be an alien signature? I mean, could nature produce anything that was that accurate? Uh, but she also found eventually a few other sources spaced out on the sky. And the distance between these sources was too big for this to be a single civilization. So they concluded that actually, yes, these were natural stars. And this is where the theory of pulsars came from. So there we have pulsars that are normally so regular you can time an atomic clock by them. <coughs> Except this pulsar. So this pulsar has a very catchy name, PSR 1257 plus 12. PSR stands for Pulsating Source of Radio. And this coordinate here is its position in the sky. And for this particular pulsar, the time between the flashes arriving on Earth changed very slightly. And Volshen kept doing this equation and he kept checking his calculation, but no, there was this slight wobble. And in the end, what it turned out to be due to was two planets. So these planets were orbiting the star. And as the planet's gravity tugged on the star, the star makes a slight wobble. And as it does, it moves very slightly towards the Earth and very slightly further away. And as it does this wobble, the timing of its pulses changes because when it's a bit closer, the pulse arrives a bit faster. And when it's a tiny bit further away, the pulse arrives a bit slower. So as the pulsar's distance from the Earth changed, so did this arrival time. So it was indicative of these planets. So let's have a nice artist's impression of this. Here is our pulsar. Here is planet one and planet two. And discerning viewers will note there's actually planet three there that was discovered later. So the first two planets were named St. Monica, B and C. And they were both about four times the mass of the Earth. And their years were 65 and 98 days. So if they were sitting in our own solar system, they would be either side of Mercury. And they are a staggering 2,000 light years away, which shows how sensitive this technique is to finding tiny planets. So, second question. How do you think pulsar planets form? I'm going to give you two hints. The first thing to think about is that, remember, pulsars start with this big explosion. So you should think about what that means for any planets that were around the star at the time. And the second is that a second hint, pulsars with planets are often born with a stellar twin. So they often form as two stars together orbiting one another. Do you have any idea how this might work? Okay, I'm liking what I'm hearing here. Let's have some ideas. First group, put your hand up. There's someone further near the back. I know I can call on these guys because I've already heard their ideas. Tell me what you're thinking. I heard some of it, so I know it's good. 
you, I heard good stuff from this area. <laughs> So you're saying the stars come together and then they hit each other and then you still end up with the planets around each other. Okay, that's one theory. How about you guys? Uh, since, uh, since it started with a big explosion and there's two of them, uh, its gravitational pull would be not, not compressing each other but more like trying to tear each other apart. And that created the rhythm which created a pulsar star, pulsar planet. Okay, that's actually incredibly close. Well done. Anyone else? We think it has something to do with the debris. With three? With the debris left over from when the uh, star collapsed into a neutron star. There was some debris and that gets picked up by the, uh, by the gravity of the neutron star. Right, so actually that was one of the theories. Um, that um, So one theory was that in the explosion, the star blows off a lot of its matter. And could this come back down and be recaptured? And people did computer models of this. That's how likely it was. But in the end, it was concluded not enough matter could come together after the explosion. So absolutely very legitimate theory, but not our favourite. Um, so the stars coming together in an explosion... They actually <coughs> don't quite, but we're going to use that idea. And same with yours. So you'll see how close you guys were. So here is the problem with an explosion. <coughs> so when you start off with an explosion, <coughs> kaboom, if you were a planet orbiting at the time, two pretty awful things could happen to you. The first is you could just be incinerated. And the second is the shock from that explosion could kick you out the system. So this is why we think that you can't have planets surviving going the star going into a pulsar. So then the question is, well, how come we have planets there if they couldn't have survived the pulsar process? So a clue to what might be happening was seen in 2012 when a tiny star was discovered that seemed to be flashing red, then blue, then red, then blue, then red, then blue. And after careful observation, it was concluded it was orbiting an unseen pulsar every hour and a half. So that's really quick. How long is a lesson here? One hour-ish? Yeah, one hour. -ish. Yeah, so less than two lessons. And this, pul this star could go around this pulsar really, really fast. So what was <laughs> happening is that you were seeing different colours because if this was the pulsar, and you were looking at the star from this side, you were seeing its hot side because the pulsar jet was hitting that star. But as the, as the star turned around and it then faced its back to the Earth, you saw the cold side because the pulsar jet was only hitting its front side. So what was actually happening to this poor star was the pulsar was literally blow torching it to pieces. So it looked like this. So while there was not a direct collision between the two stars, the pulsar, once it became a pulsar, did start to rip its twin to shreds. And as the star was ripped to pieces by the pulsar, a new disk was formed from its ruined body to orbit the pulsar. And from this ruined star, <coughs> planets began to form. So these new planets, we think, are actually from the remains of a star that was ripped to pieces, formed a brand new protoplanetary disk around the pulsar, and then was reborn from these ashes. It's actually pretty morbid. All right. So we've done the first star, the first planet around a sun-like star. We've done the first planet ever. This was the first multi-planet system discovered. So the first star to be orbited, to be found orbited by more than one planet. Now, in this case, we have a protoplanetary disk and we therefore know that the planets should be forming very nicely in a plane because they all formed in this disk pizza shape around the star. So we do not expect to see wild orbits like this going at all angles. However, 
This particular system was orbited by four gas giant planets, a little like our own system, but actually bigger. And two of these had very, very strange orbits. So this is a simulation of the system. And we're going to zoom in and take a look. So that's a nice circular orbit on the inner one. But these are the orbits of the outer two. And they are at completely crazy angles. They're not circular. They're not, they're not in a plane. They're just completely crazy. And this was the Epsilon Andromeda system. So just a reminder, here is our solar system. We have nice circular orbits all in a nice plane. And this is Epsilon Andromeda. It does not have circular orbits. That star is not in the center of its orbit. And if you look at the system sideways on, these are not in a plane. So we have just broken two of the rules we made with planet formation. How do you think these planets form? So I haven't got any clues for this one. I'll come back to you in two minutes. Right. <laughs> All right, shall we hear some ideas? Chris, what are you, what's your group talking about? So, uh, I, I will speak on behalf of this group, but this was all their idea. Okay. Their thought is that a neutron star, uh, quite far away, mm -hmm. exploded. And it was so, it wasn't close enough that it destroyed these planets, but it was further enough it was close enough that it affected their orbits. Right, so actually a shot from outside affected the planet's orbits. Great idea, guys. Yep. Yeah. Crazy, but, um, I love crazy, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's the way, if there are two pieces of these things that sort of um, crossed each other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we had two <laughs> protoplanetary disks at different angles. Yeah. Awesome. Anyone else? How about you? Uh, you always have ideas. Yeah. <laughs> Um, some force. Uh, it's similar to their idea, but uh, uh, a neutron star and supernova happen and it pushed uh, planets away. Okay. And the other idea is that while they're orbiting the uh, sun, well, their their sun, mm. they're also kind of orbiting to uh, other smaller planets in front of them, which makes an irregular orbit. But because that uh, they are at different uh, uh, times uh, while they're or orbiting, uh, that eventually created a different orbit while they were orbiting that planet. I see so what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to pull these into some general ideas. We have the external force idea that both of you guys have highlighted. Now, this actually can and frequently does produce strange orbits. Um, we don't think it's the reason for this one. Um, but typically, it's not necessarily even a neutron star. What we find is that when you have these binary star systems, and they're very, 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 very common in the universe, the second star's gravitational pull can actually influence the orbits of the planets. And so it's one way, actually, of getting a hot Jupiter. It's another way of getting this very bent orbit. So this absolutely can happen, and it doesn't even need a distant neutron star. It can be done just with a regular star with the gravitational pull. Um, the two pizza plate crossing ideas is awesome. I love it. Um, in fact, it is a little hard to get it working for reasons that I did not tell you before. And that is when the star forms, it's spinning. And so the pizza plate where you form your planets tends to be always spinning in the same direction as a star. So normally planets are formed altogether like that it's quite hard to get a system where you would have two disks crossing, unless you had something even more crazy that might still be out there, but I don't know of it yet. So the idea as well with multiple planet orbits getting confused um, is not dissimilar from what we're gonna go with. Uh, of course, you do have planets orbiting one another. We tend to call one the moon and one the planets, but it's basically a joint orbit system. It's normally fairly stable, providing the moon is a lot smaller than the planet and the planet is a lot smaller than the star. If that isn't true, then you can get things messed up, but what normally happens is that everything ends up orbiting the biggest object. Uh, however, I'm gonna show you a similar scenario for this one. 
So, the thing about giant planets tend to have giant gravity. And that means if the planets are orbiting perfectly fine around the star, but then they get too close, kaboom, there can be a kick. So what happens here is that the planet's gravity pulls on one another and you end up with a slingshot effect that can send the planets scattering off in different orbits. So this can create very bent orbits that are very elliptical and at all kinds of angles and it can even eject a planet from the system. So here is a simulation of what we think might have happened to a similar system as Upsilon Andromeda. So here are two planets, they're orbiting the star, everyone's happy, but they start getting closer and every time they get closer, they get a bit of a kick. And eventually they're going to pass very close to one another and something awful is gonna happen. Boing, bye bye. <laughs> so in the case of this four system gas giant, the main theory is there were once five gas giants. And during these close encounters, one just got too close and it was slingshotted out the system completely. The other planet was knocked onto this very elliptical orbit and then its gravity pulled the other planet also onto a very elliptical orbit, producing these very crossed patterns. So once you've formed in your nice, safe protoplanetary disk, it's not over. Terrible, terrible things can still happen to you as a planet and you can sometimes be voted off the island entirely. So, what do you think happens when a planet's ejected? A couple of minutes in this one? So this is a planet that's being kicked away from the star. What do you think happens next? Does it come back? Does it join another star? What, what happens to these guys? Do they disintegrate? <laughs> Okay, what are we thinking? How about something from this group over here? Come on guys, be brave. Anyone from that corner? Yes. Um, so once it gets rejected, it might join another star's orbit. Okay, so it could join another star's orbit, agreed. Anyone else? Back? Parents? Any comments? Sorry, you can't hear. It comes back by the gravity. It can come back. Right, yes, so it could shoot off and then get returned because eventually it gets pulled back by the star. You guys? Yeah. Um, we were saying that um, it's probably traveling really fast if it's wind shotted. Mm -hmm. So maybe it crashed into um, the other planets or um, maybe that's how the graveyard forms. Oh, yeah, so you get some rubbly leftovers. Yeah, good thought. Uh, since the since space doesn't have a... Okay, so when you throw something on Earth, it either stops because of gravity or if it's... Uh, but, or because of the friction it's hitting to, like, the air molecule. But since... In, but the vacuum in space doesn't have anything to friction onto. So since it's... Uh, when it's ejected, it's either... It's going... It's not going to stop until it finds unless something else to orbit. So it might keep going forever. Yeah. So I'm going to say you're all right. <laughs> so what can happen depends on the speed at which it's been sent away. If it hasn't been sent with quite enough speed to escape the sun's gravity, it will come back. And in fact, we have a lot of examples of that. We have the comets. So these are small rocks that were scattered outwards, probably by Jupiter. And they've ended up almost at the very, very, very edge of our solar system in a place even more distant than the Kuiper Belt that we call the Oort Cloud. And we've never seen the Oort Cloud directly. It's too distant. But this is the knife edge of the solar system. It's the point where you are just held by the sun's gravity. And if you can stop there, you can stay technically in our solar system. But any little nudge will send you on an orbit. And that's where you have the comets. So these long distance comets come from here. If you have enough velocity to escape the sun, then exactly what you said happens. You can potentially go forever. That's not to say that it's impossible that you could not be captured by another star. You could be if you come at the star with enough 
or really slow enough to be captured. It's not impossible, it can definitely happen. Um, and indeed, in the recent news, we've actually seen what looks like a comet from another star system. And that was probably slingshotted out in just this way and eventually passed by our star. Now, our sun is not going to be able to hold on to this. It's going to leave again. But if it had been moving slightly slower, we could have maybe held on to it and adopted it into our system. So could it have formed the rubbly, rockly leftovers with a collision? Yes. The only reason that that's less likely is that space is really big. So the probability of hitting something is surprisingly small. And we forget that because when we see movies, especially of Hollywood and the asteroid belt, it looks pretty densely packed. And indeed, when NASA first sent their probes, the Pioneer probes, to the outer solar system, they were like, would it get through the asteroid belt? Is that possible? Or will the spacecraft just collide with the rocks and be destroyed? Turns out, even in the asteroid belt, the rocks are pretty far apart. So it's actually very easy to get through them. So a collision, completely possible in theory, but in practice, you probably avoid it. So, if you escape entirely, then you become what's known as a rogue planet or rogue world, sometimes also called orphan planets because they've got no parent star. It's very sad. So if you are on a rogue world or around a rogue world, it is night 100% of the time because you've got no star. And NASA did some rather fun travel posters of what it might be like around a rogue planet. And I think the byline is where the nightlife never ends. So probably most rogue planets were formed around a star, but were ejected, as I suggested there. Rejected. Rejected? Well, rejected. <laughs> yes, exactly. Ejected and rejected. All right, so I have one final example for you guys. And this is known as Tabby's star. And it's one that's been in the news a lot over the last couple of years. So let me explain what happened here. Planets are often found with something called the transit technique. And this is the small dip in starlight as the planet passes in front of the star's surface. So if you have a bigger dip, it means you have a bigger planet. So a Jupiter-sized planet dips the starlight by just 1%. If you have an Earth, it's barely visible. It's very, very, very hard to detect. So this is what we're talking about. Tiny, tiny drops in starlight to find this, these planets. However, in May 2009, something really weird was seen. This was seen. Now the drop is about 1%, so Jupiter-sized planets, okay, that seems quite reasonable. But it was a giant duration for the transit. So a normal transit lasts a few hours as the planet just passes across the star's surface and just disappears around the back. This lasted about a week. So it's some sort of giant non-circular thing that's orbiting this star. It was also an asymmetric dip, so we expect it to look like this. It goes down, it goes up, because your planet's round. But this was kind of down and then up and then sort of, sort of weirdly down at the end. Not quite sure what's going on there. So this is very strange. Then, in March 2011, around the same star, people saw this. Much more symmetric, you might think. Aha, now it's behaving itself. But this is a 15% drop in brightness. Really, really huge. Like Jupiter, 1%, remember? 15%. Then in February 2013, around the same star, while well, they kept watching it, hoping it would start to make sense. They saw this. Yeah, like, what, what, just, just, just what? What? Well, what is going on here? So we have a 20% drop in the center. And then multiple dips of craziness. So, here is your final challenge. Can you explain Tabby's star? Now these three things tell you something. It tells you this big one, which asymmetric, suggests this is something that's not circular, like a planet. It's amazingly big somehow. And it's very, very irregular. So a planet we just expect to see 
on the clock every time it orbits. But this is very crazy all over the place. What's your best guess? All right, guys, what have you got for me? Tell me your idea. Uh, I think it's like a planet and a moon, but they're like the same size. Mm -hmm. So like, yeah, basically a planet, moon system, so multiple dips from that. Yeah. Hold that thought. Anyone else? It's just too weird for you guys, you know, it's too weird for us too. Anyone else? Parents, what are you thinking? Uh, we're thinking maybe there's a... Uh, like irregular planets, but they're actually irregular uh, stars. Stars with irregular orbits that are uh, orbiting the heavy star. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So actually, different stars instead of planets. All right. Anyone else? No theory is too crazy for this one. And you'll see what I mean when I give you some suggestions. <laughs> giant dwarf planet. Giant giant dwarf planet would be a planet. <laughs> Maybe a black hole would be a, a black hole might have been doing something, something to the star. Yeah. So, you know, could it be, as I think you're suggesting, a star in a very irregular orbit, which would be a dwarf planet? Could it be a planet with moons? <coughs> could it be some kind of thing with other stars? And all those things were considered. So just going through the idea, a planet with a moon would indeed cause like a joint dip. So this area dip, dip. could be something like a planet with a moon. But regardless of the size, we would expect this to be periodic. So we'd expect the same system to come back every, however long it takes for an orbit. So in principle, yes for messy dips, but it doesn't explain all of this. Even two planets together is too much dip for that. Um, the idea that it could be star-related, maybe not with another star, but with some sort of stellar activity, was definitely considered. So could this not be a planet at all, but just maybe something odd going on with the star's surface? That was considered, but we know what type of star this is, and actually it's pretty quiet. It shouldn't be doing anything odd, based on our knowledge of stars. So, is that new ideas? Yeah, so could it be planets on elliptical orbits? They are definitely possible and we absolutely see them, but we still see a pattern. So even if they're like, like you say with the dwarf planets that can have very strange orbits, they're still ultimately periodic. Like they still come back at the same rates, even though they're on very squished orbits. So we don't expect something quite this crazy from that. Different certainly, but not quite this crazy. So, we don't know. This is actually a mystery. So this is going to be an open question, guys, and you are welcome to go into the field and solve it, because we do not know what is going on with Tabby Star. We do have some ideas. So one idea that was thought of is actually, could the star still be surrounded by its dusty protoplanetary disk? And there were just lots of lumps and bumps in there that are changing because they're forming planets. Or, for instance, could you have a huge impact between two planets, like the one that created our own moon, and that would have just produced dust everywhere, <coughs> and could, like, lumps and bumps in the dust produce this strange effect? The problem with these ideas is that the star isn't young, so we're not expecting to still see the planet-forming disk. It should have long ago gone. And the collision between the planets, possible, it would be super rare. So it was almost a bit too lucky. And the other problem is there should be heat with a lot of dust. If you have a lot of dust, you expect it to be emitting heat. And we don't see any heat signature from this at all. So uh, not impossible, but not great. Another idea is it could be a huge swarm of comets. So these are on our very elliptical orbits, but there's just lots of them, and they're all bombarding this star. And because they're small, they're disappearing, they're coming back, 
there's not a consistent number, so we're getting these very strange peaks. And when we happen to catch them when they're all together, we get a very, very, very large dip. So not dissimilar from the idea there might be dwarf planet orbits or multiple planets going on here, but actually comet-sized. It actually does fit the observations, this one. Yeah, Enough of them are. It's just numbers. You're right, an individual comet, absolutely not. But what we're talking here is we would need thousands. So it fits the observations, which still makes it the most likely scenario. But you do need thousands of comets to do this. And is that likely? It's a little unlikely. We're not sure. We've never seen a system with this many comets. So the last idea that has been given media attention is, could it be an alien megastructure? And this was seriously considered. So the idea here is something called a Dyson sphere, where if you became more advanced than the human civilization, you would want to start to harness a lot of the sun's energy. And to do that, you would start building huge space-based solar panels around the star. And that could cause these very weird structures that we're seeing. Is it impossible? No, no, it's not impossible. But have we ruled out all other options? No, no, we haven't. So the general view is before you start saying aliens, you should be really, really certain that it's not something else, because that is a huge claim. And right now, we still think it's probably something else. So it's a really cool idea, should never be totally ruled out, but it's still not the most likely. So I'm going to give that one a really big question mark and say from Carl Sagan that if you have an extraordinary claim, you require an extraordinary amount of evidence. And we haven't quite got that yet for Tabby Star, but the truth is out there. Thank you very much.